Did you know that the average college graduate owes more than $37,000 after graduation? And less than 54% of high school graduates heading off to four-year colleges actually graduate within six years. Hello, I'm Jamila Freelane, author of Free Money for College and the founder of Encouraging Words College Prep. Now, in my new book, I tackle these issues head on. It is filled with more than 50 tips, resources, programs, and college and career preparation information. My new show on the Wake Up Call radio and TV broadcasting network is an extension of that book. Each week, you will be inspired by a tremendous student or a tremendous community leader, and sometimes both. You'll also learn how to save money on college costs. So tune in each week to get inspired and learn something new all at the same time. Hello and welcome to the Encouraging Words Show. I'm your host, Jamila Freeland, and it is a pleasure to have you tuned in. Let me tell you, if you've been missing out on the Encouraging Words Show, you've missed some great topics and some great guests. Tonight, I have a very special guest, and I can't wait to tell you more about him. Now, for those of you who are tuning in for the first time, let me mm -hmm. tell you, the Encouraging Words Show is all about celebrating students everywhere. So whether you're a middle school student, a high school student, or even a college student, or even perhaps a person that's returning to school, this is the show for you. We celebrate students everywhere. When you watch this show, we want you to get inspired. We want you to walk away with college and career preparation tips. And we want you to understand how to reduce your college debt. Now, my special guest for today is Mr. Osceola Thomas. He is an author, a poet, a wonderful individual, a consultant. And he's also the father of two college students. Thank you for coming, to, uh, thank you for, coming for the show. Thank you for the invite. Okay, well, we're pleased to have you. And for those of you who, are, again, are tuning in for the first time, let me tell you a little bit more about the show and what our theme is for tonight. Now, the Encouraging Words show is actually based on the book Free Money for College. This is actually a book that I wrote with the intent of being a resource and a tool for students and parents everywhere, middle school and high school. And again, I really believe that middle school, if you start out early, you can get the biggest bang for your buck when you have a book like this as your resource. Now, um, tonight's show again is going to be featuring a special, a special theme and I hope you enjoy it as much as I'm enjoying uh, doing the show for for uh, today. Now, when we talk about um, Mr. Osceola Thomas's background, first of all, I mentioned you're an author and you've written several books, but you've got a new book out. So tell me about your book and, and it's, how it's different from your other books. Well, I'm a controversial author. So my latest title is The Streets Can't Have My Son, and it deals with the disproportionality of black boys in special education and also locked facilities across the country. Mm -hmm. So the book addresses the question, why are black boys missing in action? And in the book I talk about M, they're miseducated through curriculums of genocide that promote self-hate. They're medicated with drugs that the DEA classifies in the same category as opium, morphine, and cocaine. The I, they're incarcerated through the school to prison pipeline and that's through the adoption of zero tolerance policies and also the recruitment of school resource officers in our public schools. And once these social institutions can make black boys out to be unintelligent and a threat to community safety, that implicit bias mm -hmm. now gives law enforcement justification to commit their annihilation so they're annihilated. Mm -hmm. So those are the things that the book address. Why are black boys missing in action? And I think that's so profound and a very timely, a relevant book, very, very much so. If you haven't guessed it by, uh, by now from hearing the intro for our, for our first guest, today's show is dedicated to the African-American male. So we're going to talk about some of the disparities and some of the inequities in the community and in the educational system. And then we're also going to talk about some of the solutions and options that are available so that that way we can reclaim our community and empower our young men in our community as well. So thank you for that introduction. Now, when we think about the school to prison pipeline, tell me a little bit more about that. Or, and for the audience members that may not even be familiar with that terminology, what exactly is that? The school to prison pipeline deals with uh, those forces that actually force black boys out of the public school system mm -hmm. and into the juvenile justice system. Wow. So if you look at no, one of the number one factors of black males dropping out of high school, as a matter of fact, any child, is suspension. Research says that suspension more than poverty 
is the predictor that a child will drop out of school. Wow. Starting at pre-kindergarten, black boys are 3.6 times more likely to be suspended than their white counterparts. So if suspension is the predictor and black boys are almost four times more likely to be suspended, what does that say for the state of the black male in compulsory education? Mm. So the school to prison pipeline, let's take North Carolina for example. Okay. In our great state, which is a punitive state, we spend on mm. average across all 100 counties $8,414 for one year's worth of compulsory education in the K-12 through continuum. So without any special EC services, accommodations, etc., that's a standard education, $8,414. To incarcerate that same child in a youth detention center or youth development center, which is a locked facility, we spend $159,750. You can educate 17 children for the price of incarcerating one. So while we don't have money to give teacher raises, and we're constantly laying off support staff, you will never hear a judge say, because we're in the midst of an economic downturn in the state of North Carolina, we do not have the money to fund a new prison bed. We will find money to incarcerate if we can't educate. Mm -hmm. And that's very true. What I've noticed too, and being that my side of, of uh, your your um, topic for today is really on the side of education. I remember just learning several years ago, over 15 years ago now, that prisons are oftentimes built based upon third grade reading levels. So in other words, one of the things that they do as a projection to really be able to predict how many people they're going to house in a prison, and unfortunately, oftentimes the target market is African American boys, yes. Um, it's based on literacy rates. So those things from an educator standpoint um, and from an, a college administration standpoint really resonated with me. Can you talk more about, um, can you talk more about uh, some of the differences in terms of um, maybe college completion or that sort of thing as it relates to um, what you were speaking of? Yes, so you're exactly correct. Most states, or a lot of states, should I say, third and fourth grade reading statistics is how they project new prison beds. So if a child is not proficient in reading by grade three, they're already projecting a new prison bed for that child. As a matter of fact, I believe the percentage is somewhere between 80 and 85 percent of all youth introduced to the juvenile justice system, they're functionally illiterate. Mm -hmm. So everything is based on reading data. One of the things that I always share, as a, not only as an author, but also as a proposal writer, is the goal is to convene nonprofits and public school systems around the decision-making table, and the goal is to apply for dollars so we can address those educational disparities, because there are actually dollars earmarked to address reading deficiencies. Absolutely. And one of those grant programs is called Title IV-B funding, where the U.S. Department of Education gives dollars to the states, the states become grantees, and the recipient of those dollars become sub-grantees. And those dollars are earmarked specifically to improve student academic outcomes in the core content areas of reading and math. Okay. But if a child is not reading proficient, they're eventually going to drop out of school because they are not able to keep up with the core requirements of compulsory education. As a matter of fact, I believe it's the Black Star Project said that 10% of black boys in eighth grade are reading proficient. 10%. So if only 10% are reading proficient in the 8th grade, what's the chance they're going to remain in school in the ninth grade, which is the highest dropout grade in the K-12 yeah. continuum? Absolutely. Very true. Then the likelihood is slim to none. That's exactly That's correct. Answer. Right, right. Um, so that being said, when I think even about some of the things that you've mentioned, um, you mentioned how many students and how many uh, children typically in the juvenile justice system are oftentimes um, maybe illiterate or a lot of times it's because they have maybe learning deficiencies or they've experienced some type of trauma. Oftentimes there's issues like severe poverty. So it's a matter of maybe not like you said, penalizing them or being punitive with that, but acknowledging that these conditions exist for this particular population and <coughs> adapting or coming up with really innovative uh, ways to educate them. And one of the reasons I'm 
have been such such an advocate in education and been with education as long as I have is because I don't believe in just traditional education. I believe strongly in career and technical education because some students are more uh, hands-on learners. Some are uh, visual spatial, as you'll find when you look at yes. the MI yes. project, uh, which the host of that show is Rochelle Gray. Uh, she's on the, the Wake Up uh, Call Network as well. And when it comes down to it, if you're able to then uh, funnel and channel uh, those, those students into some other avenues or ways, not only does it build confidence, but it provides an outlet and a potential career path for those, those uh, individuals, and it, it breaks the cycle, so to yes. speak. You just hit on two very key points. First, <coughs> principles have a challenge in public schooling. Absolutely. That, that's first and foremost. <laughs> principals yeah, no have doubt. a challenge. So every principal have, has a line item budget. Mm -hmm. They have a line item for instructional uh, salaries, transportation, nutritional services, custodial services, etc. Mm -hmm. But what happens when children who come from poverty-stricken neighborhoods have non-academic barriers that negatively impact student learnings. Where does the resources come from to address those issues? Mm -hmm. So if Johnny comes to school and Johnny doesn't have clean clothes, Johnny hair isn't done, he's uh, you know disheveled, etc. Mm -hmm. The principal doesn't have the discretionary funds in their budget to say, okay, I'm going to uh, take care of the hygiene or the cosmetology or the uniforms. Therefore, it's necessary for them to bring nonprofits or collaborative partners to the table to expand their services array mm -hmm. to address those non-academic barriers okay, that's, so that's negatively impacting student learning. And that's where I come in mm -hmm. to say, look, let's convene collaborative partners around the table. <coughs> let's create a graduated continuum of services so that we are impacting the child holistically. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, number one. And then number two, you touched on the fact that most teachers don't understand the need to differentiate instruction. Mm -hmm. Most instruction is geared toward it's ditto easy. sheets, mm -hmm. textbooks, lectures, child sits in a seat, but African American students are more kinesthetic and tactile. Mm -hmm. So we have to differentiate instruction. As a matter of fact, in the book I share that I don't believe that it's the children that have the disability or the disorder. I believe it's the organization or the system. Mm -hmm. It's differentiation instruction disorder. And so that, that's one of the things that we point out uh, in the book that needs to be addressed. So my goal is to, again, when it comes to compulsory schooling, show them the dollars that's available, why it's necessary to partner with external collaborative partners, the faith-based community, grassroots nonprofits, because public schools can't do it by themselves. And it's also necessary to recruit the post-secondary, specifically the HBCUs, so they can teach the young white female teachers who are the majority of the educational workforce how to become culturally competent and deal with their implicit bias that dictate their negative interactions with students of color. Right, and because perception becomes reality That's again, exactly correct. There, there's a lack of sensitivity training or understanding then all of that is communicated in mm -hmm. how they you know dictate their classroom and as a result um, a lot of times the african-american boys bear the brunt that's that. exactly so, correct absolutely i understand now what we're going to do is take a break okay. and i want to thank you for coming and My you'll pleasure. see <laughs> and you'll see actually uh, a couple of quotes um, on the next uh, screen that you see before you there just has a powerful quote about uh, Osceola and uh, directly from his book and then we're going to close out on the last slide before we go to break with information on where you can get Osceola's book. I want to thank you for watching. Make sure you stay tuned. we got another powerful guest talking about college and talking about African American uh, boys as it relates to education. I ain't going to college. Wow. My name is Marlo Prelo, and this is a book that I've authored that just came out this year in 2017. I'm very excited about this piece. This book really talks about and inspires the youth to have a plan for your life after high school. It goes into a lot of different stories about things that I've gone through in my life, and I'm just here to say that if I can do it, you can certainly do it. I ain't going to college. It's available now on Amazon. You can also find it at www.careerbounds.org because I did go to college. Hey, 
Thanks for tuning in to the Encouraging Word Show. I told you we have two powerful guests today, and I, I promise you this one is nothing short of amazing. Again, the Encouraging Word Show, for those of you who may be just tuning in, is a show that's all about empowerment of students everywhere. Whether you're a middle school, high school, or college student, this show is for you. It's meant for you to get inspired, meant for you to get some college and career preparation tips, and understand how to reduce your college debt. Now, my guest for today is Mr. Marlo Prelu. And Marlo Prelu is nothing short of incredible. Marlo Prelu, as you'll see from the graphic that's there on the screen, is the author of this new book here, I Ain't Going to College. Now, I Ain't Going to College is a wonderful title and captures uh, the essence of who this man is. He'll tell you how he got started and why this was his uh, particular position and, and state of mind at one point in time and how that has evolved and how he's evolved uh, as, a, as, a, as a professional. He's worked in corporate America for a number of years and then he was really inspired and got into his calling, his passion of education. He's been a high school teacher. He's been an enrollment manager. He's been a direct, well, he is now a director of admissions. So tell me, how did you go from I ain't going to college to becoming the director of admissions for the college? Tell me about that. I know, it's, um, <clears throat> it, it's quite an outstanding story, but you know, really, I ain't going to college is, is one of those stories that many students are still saying and it's still resonating with a lot of people today mm -hmm. you know i said those words over and over repeatedly you know as a young man and as a student and as i was teaching high school i didn't understand why am i still hearing students say i ain't going to college i'm like it's over 20 years later and people are still saying the same thing so i wanted to take some time and, and really focus on how can we break that myth you know mm -hmm. and dispel that rumor and move students away from thinking that you know college is not something that they should do um, and really just focus more on educating yourself and, and having a plan so as I got into higher education and you know moved into admissions and really started working with a number of young people uh, as well as older people we have a lot of older adults that are going back to college right, uh, you absolutely. know trying to career changers mm -hmm. dislocated workers all mm -hmm. of that mm -hmm. and people who want to finish up credits maybe they started mm -hmm earlier but didn't get a chance to you know finish the education so right. you know making the transition uh, it, it's definitely interesting when I look at the words and I think about you know what I do now but you know I know that education is important I see the power of it even as working in corporate America you know the times that I got promoted you know there were many times when I was young African-American male you know moving through the ranks and I was getting promotions and things like that, and people were going, wow, you know, look at this guy. He's, you know, he's rocking and rolling. He's right. moving in a great direction mm -hmm. and being promoted. And I've been here for years and years, and they didn't understand why am I being promoted in, when other people were not. And, you know, part of the reason was because, you know, I not only did I educate myself, mm -hmm. but I took the time to really take the information in. And once I got into those different positions, then, you know, I used the information, and that's really what helped propel me. So. Awesome, awesome, awesome. So before we really delve into the book, I want to talk about you personally. So what was it that made the change? I know personally um, something that happened that really sparked and, and interested you and, and also propelled you to not only become a director of admissions, but also to start your own organization. Tell me about your first college visit. Oh, yeah, definitely. You know, I attended South Carolina State University, so shout out to, to those mighty bulldogs. And, you know, I just didn't, again, I didn't think it was important, but I had a mentor, someone who came into my life, you know, around my senior year of high school, and he said, you know, I have a trip that's going to take place next week, and I want you to be on it. And uh, I said, well, is there going to be food on this trip? <laughs> I, I just wanted to eat. Food basically. and girls. That's right. That's right. That's right. Some people are attracted to, you know, school for different reasons. <laughs> so and he had to get what appealed to you, right? At that, that time. That is correct. Okay. And we still have to do that to a certain extent today. You Absolutely. know, some of Absolutely. it is marketing. You know, we can talk about that, you know, here shortly. But mm -hmm. so we went on that trip to South Carolina State and you know, we didn't know where we were going, we didn't know exactly oh, wow. what we were gonna do. We just knew we were going on a trip and, and there was food. gonna be food. <laughs> so we came over the hill and we saw these big <laughs> words, South Carolina State University. And we just fell apart. Oh my God! This guy's taking us to the college. You know, this is ridiculous. You know, what is this? We were playing cards, you know, on the in the bus, and we were taking out our shirts and ties and loosening them up and things like that. Right. And you know, once we got on campus and began to see people with skin as dark as ours, with hair as curly as ours, right. 
you know, some people pants were sagging lower than mine. And, okay. You know, we just realized that college kids are actually regular, normal people. Right, it made it and tangible. And it did. It, it just made it, we made a connection. And we felt like, you know what, if these guys are here and they're doing it, when I look at myself, I see myself in these students that are here. Absolutely. And right at that moment, the very thing that I thought was so intangible was something that, you know, I was too black, too short, mm -hmm. too poor, couldn't afford it, wasn't college material, mm -hmm. you know, that it just wasn't for me. In an instant, all of those insecurities mm -hmm. were wiped away because mm -hmm. now I'm on the campus, I'm able to see what's going on, and at that point I made the connection and I felt like, you know what, I can do it. Right, right. So then tell me about uh, career bound and how what career bound is number one and how that ties into the book because of course we want to touch on uh, some of the things absolutely. in the book as well I would yeah. be remiss not to talk about the book yeah absolutely so career bound is is my 501c3 nonprofit organization that um, I founded you know really in the neighborhoods you know of West Side some to South Carolina brought it into Charlotte and you know what we do is we go into low income middle schools low income high schools and we talk to students about the education piece and we talk to them about why it's important to not only have a plan for your life after high school, you know, whether it's, you know, working, whether it's school, you know, whether it's military, but the most important thing is when you graduate and walk across that stage, you need to have a plan for your life. Because if you don't and you get into that idle time, that's where, you know, boys 18 to 24 start to move towards incarceration, and it starts earlier than that, but that's one of the peak moments because you're out of school, you have free time, you maybe you're trying to find a job, maybe you're working at Subway, Pizza Hut, maybe you're working at a warehouse or something at night, but you begin to get into things and you start moving around, so that's one of those critical points. So I really wanted to focus on, you know, what can I do to reach back in the community and really help people understand that when I walk, I want to go right from A to B and mm -hmm. really, you know, get into whatever it is that I want to do. So that's why I started the organization, mm -hmm. and, and that's what we do. You know, we, we do some road mapping, and we try to set students up so that they know, hey, I have a plan, and this is what I'm doing. And it mm -hmm. changes, you know. It, it ebbs and flows. What you start with doesn't have to be the exact same thing that you finish with. Absolutely. But at least, you know, having a plan that changes is a good thing as well because mm -hmm. you still have a plan. Absolutely, absolutely. There's no crime in, what is it, there's there's a quote that I really, really like, and it says, it's no uh, crime in not uh, reaching for a star. The crime is, or the the issue is having no star to reach for. So, for Sorry. example, if you don't have mm -hmm. a game plan at all, that's, that's really going to be uh, critical to your success, whether or not you have a plan. Now, your plan, as you mentioned, could shift, evolve, it could change, it could grow, it could expand, but having a plan of some sort is critical. So is that what you talk about a lot in the book, is uh, having a plan? Yeah, the book definitely focuses um, a lot on, you know, really understanding in the ninth grade, I want to focus on grades, academia, striving for a certain GPA, getting involved in clubs and organizations. And from ninth grade to 12th grade, each year you should be progressing. Your knowledge should be progressing, but you should also be stacking up those intangibles, doing things outside of the school to build your resume so that when you get to your senior year, unlike myself, who was a person who never took Algebra one, never took geometry, mm -hmm. the chemistries, and the maths, and the sciences, mm -hmm. I floated right below the radar, took mm -hmm. you know, just enough classes to have mm -hmm. credits mm -hmm. you know, so that I could graduate. So right. when I did figure out, okay, maybe the college thing is going to work, maybe right. for me it's real, now I'm unprepared. So everybody's saying, well, you know you're unprepared, right? Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, you know, what, what else can I do, you know, at this <laughs> right. point? But guess what? I'm going to figure it out, I'm going to mm -hmm. find a way, and I'm going to make it happen. And, you know, and that's what I did in those last six months. So it was just a huge push, you know, mm -hmm. really starting in January. To get on track. Mm -hmm. I figured out, you know, what I wanted to do. So I said, you know what? There's no way people that know me are going to come behind me can going to experience the same thing. So mm -hmm. I'm going to do everything I can. Um, you know, try to get the information out so that there is a road mapping system of some sort mm -hmm. so that you can look at it and say, oh, okay, I can follow these steps and kind of position myself so that I can do what I need to do. 
Excellent, excellent. And I think that's very valuable knowledge that you're sharing because somebody watching at home is looking at this and thinking the very same thing that you thought when you stepped on that campus. When you stepped on that campus, you said, I see somebody that looks like me. You thought, mm, if he can do it, I can do it. Mm -hmm. Somebody out there watching is thinking the very same thing about you. They're like, wow, you know, okay, I didn't maybe have the best grades, but you mean I can pull it together and I can move up to the next level? I can actually graduate from college? For some people, because to me, it, it seems like a given that so many people are going to college now. Everybody and their mama has been to school, it seems like. But at the end of the day, for each one of those people that have been, there's thousands of others that are still out there that maybe have it in their hearts and in their minds and in their spirit that they can't go for whatever reason. So I think what you've said is very powerful. I think what you've said is very inspiring. And I know you've encouraged someone out there that's watching today. So before we wrap up again, where can we get that book? Yeah, the book is uh, definitely available at Amazon.com. You can also visit my website, which is careerbounds.org. Um, there's ordering information there, group orders, bulk orders are encouraged, as well as, you know, individual sales. Okay. So with bulk orders, that means those schools that are maybe interested in buying for mm -hmm. their middle school or their mm -hmm. high school, uh, definitely there's special pricing available. Oh, absolutely. We, okay. um, we've had some schools come on board. You know, today I was just in uh, Rock Hill at Dutchman Creek Middle School. Um, who just placed a, a very nice order with us. We definitely shout out to you guys, Dr. Williams, the principal <coughs> there. So um, we're, we're coming along, and we certainly appreciate it. Excellent, excellent. So again, I thank you for watching the Encouraging Word Show. It's always uh, great for you to watch, and I appreciate you listening. Make sure that you like the Facebook page for Encouraging Words. Make sure you share this if you've enjoyed some of the tips that were shared here today. And I want you to uh, I want to leave out actually with two quotes. One of my favorite quotes is a quote that I actually used to have on my website. I don't have it up there anymore, but it's actually relevant to today's uh, topic of focusing on African American men, and it's by Victor Hugo. It's, he that opens a school door closes a prison. The other quote that I want to leave you with, or uh, affirmation, if you will, is one of my favorites, and I learned it as a high school teen, and I think it uh, captivates and resonates with me so well because it's how I feel about a lot of the young people that I encounter, and it goes like this. You are great. You are a unique new kind of person that the world has never seen before and will never see the likes of again. You're organized. You're a hard worker. You're enthusiastic. You are a child of God. And blessed as you are with all these things, all those talents, all those gifts, there isn't a thing in the world that you can't do. With God as your partner, you will never fail. Thanks for watching the Encouraging Words show. Make sure you tune in each Thursday to the Encouraging Words page.